Well, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Stephanie Carlson. Um, Dr. Carlson was a four-year tennis letter winner with the Bulldogs and a former Northern Sun Conference doubles champion. This is a woman who at a very young age already knew that she wanted to be a tennis player and she wanted to be a doctor. At seven years old, even though no one in her family played tennis, she thought it was pretty cool and she watched the professionals and really got hooked. Tonight I think she'll share a bit of her personal story of determination. Uh, when as a high school student she learned lessons in lobbying and government in order to play on a tennis team. Um, some of her friends at UMD describe her as humble, easygoing, modest, and just a genuinely nice person. <laughs> There's her fans right there. <laughs> Dr. Carlson is really living out a dream. Ever since she was a little kid, she also says she wanted to work at the Mayo Clinic. And on match day, when she found out her residency would be at Mayo, she was truly overjoyed. Now, she is a diagnostic and interventional radiologist and an associate professor of radiology at the Mayo Clinic and with an extensive and impressive resume. So her story doesn't necessarily start with just what you know. It starts with who you know and how they helped her really get along that path that she took. She is a living example, again, of surrounding yourself with good people. I think it's a great example tonight. She has two tables with her tonight, so great to see so many friends and family. So please help me in providing a warm welcome to Dr. Stephanie Carlson. absolute honor to be here tonight and it's uh, been very fun being back in Duluth. I got up here Sunday night and I've had a chance to meet the UMD women's tennis team and uh, it has been just an absolute thrill and I'm absolutely honored to be here tonight. Um, All right, so I've uh, just got to start out by saying that I'm feeling way, way out of my comfort zone tonight. <laughs> I've given talks in front of large crowds before, but I'm used to giving scientific presentations with slides that look like this. <laughs> and I'm definitely not used to talking about me. But just remember that no matter how this talk goes tonight, it could not possibly be as painful as listening to me talk about hyperpolarized carbon-13 pyruvate. <laughs> at, le at least I hope not. So on that note, I'm going to tell you a story about myself and how tennis and UMD helped me to get to where I'm at today. And even though this is my story and it is about tennis, I believe it is really a universal story about all sports and the importance of team. And I'm hoping that it can apply to everyone here tonight. My story begins in the 1970s in Cambridge, Minnesota, a small town with a population of around 3,500 when I went to school there. I fell in love with tennis when I was seven years old watching Chris Evert and Martina Navratilova play on TV. And I realize I am really dating myself <laughs> with that one. Uh, that is not a little boy in the picture, that is actually me. <laughs> And I'm showing off my first Chrissy Everett wood racket. And below that is a picture of my first racket cover that my grandma Franny crocheted for me. I still have that, and I remember thinking I was so cool when I walked on the court with that thing. I first started out hitting a tennis ball against the garage, and then when I started breaking windows, I was told to go play on the high school courts, which I did, and they became my home for the next 10 years. And like most small towns, our tennis courts looked like the one in this picture, where the start of every match consisted of first weeding all of the cracks. I'm sure some, some of you can relate to that one. And I started out playing with anyone that I could find, usually college-age students that were home for the summer. 
but I also spent a lot of time by myself hitting the ball against a big wooden board that I asked a friend of mine to build and hang up on the fence for me. Eventually, I started playing junior tournaments in different towns and cities, and sometimes in the summer, I would play two or three tournaments a week because I loved it so much. I will be forever grateful to my mom, who drove me all over the state and got lost a lot of times doing it, uh, just so I could keep playing. But when I was 11 years old, I remember starting to worry about the fact that our school didn't have a tennis team that I could play on. I also knew even at that young age that my dream was to someday go on to, be, to study and become a doctor, but I knew how expensive that would be, and I was worried about how I would be able to do it. I thought maybe if I could get some type of tennis scholarship, that would help me get there. But I knew it would be tough to get any kind of scholarship without playing on a high school team. And then something very special happened. Thankfully, my parents were able to send me to Gustavus Tennis and Life Camp, where I met Coach Steve Wilkinson. He was the director of the camp and the Gustavus men's tennis coach for 39 years. Coach Wilkinson definitely helped me improve my game, but he also taught me life lessons that were even more important and that changed the way I looked at the game. He emphasized living by the three crowns on and off of the court, which means always having a positive attitude, always giving your full effort, and always demonstrating good sportsmanship. He also stressed the importance of always having fun, and he would paint smiley faces on everyone's racket to remind us to keep smiling, no matter what the outcome or challenges we were facing. I was also able to talk to Coach Wilkinson about how sad I was that there was no team in Cambridge, and about how I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up and was worried about paying for college tuition. He then told me his story about also having grown up in a small town with no tennis team and that his parents had petitioned a nearby school so that he could play on their team. And he told me to do the same. And most importantly, he told me to never give up. So I took his advice. Our school didn't have a boys or a girls tennis team and one of the nearby schools that we talked to would not let me play on theirs. So instead, my parents and I petitioned the Cambridge School Board to have my own varsity girls tennis team, where I was the only member. <laughs> it was opened up to other girls, but there was literally no one in the whole school at that time who wanted to play tennis. So from ninth through 12th grade, I actually played other schools all by myself. Our conference format consisted of the best of five matches. So I had to forfeit the first and second doubles matches and then play and win first, second, and third singles right in a row in order to win the meet. Sometimes the mean teams would actually make me play 3-2-1, so I'd be really tired when I played their best player. During my four years of high school competition, I was able to win my conference meets and qualify for the regional tennis tournament each year, but I always ended up losing to Duluth East in the regional semifinals. My big goal was to go to the state tournament, and in order to do that, I had to win regionals, which I was finally able to do up in Hibbing my senior year. But I will never forget how I felt on that day that should have been such a happy one. After I won the match, I remember seeing the whole team rush out to console the girl I had just beaten, and I was just standing out there on my side of the court not knowing what to do. I almost wanted to run over to her side and join in their big hug, <laughs> but I thought that might be a little weird. I was happy I had just won and was finally going to state, but I was missing something very big. I was missing a team. Thank goodness my mom was there and came running out on my side of the court to give me a big hug, which helped to save the day. And thankfully, something happened shortly after that tournament that would change my life forever. An angel by the name of Walleye appeared. Mark Walensky, or Walleye, as we called him, was the UMD women's tennis coach at the time, and he had heard about my one-girl team and saw me play at regionals. He was calling to offer me a scholarship to play tennis on the University of Minnesota Duluth women's team, and I will never forget that day. At UMD, I was thrilled to finally be playing on a team. I was also thrilled to finally be able to play doubles in addition to singles. I absolutely loved it all, and I remember feeling how new and fun it was to have my match mean something not only to me, but even more importantly to the team as a whole. 
In addition to my new tennis family, I also met a number of other amazing and generous people during my first year at UMD. I was introduced to Bob Nygaard, the UMD Sports Information Director, who I'm sure you all know. Bob was my first real boss back in 1985 when I started working in his office as part of the Student Athlete Work Study Program, which was part of the scholarship package I was given. Bob ended up becoming a very dear friend of mine, and we still keep in touch to this day. While I also introduced me to his good friend Vince Repish, who was one of the UMD football coaches at the time. And because Vinny knew I wanted to go to medical school, he introduced me to his wife, Dr. Lillian Repish, who was dean of students at the UMD Medical School, as well as an anatomy professor and cancer researcher. The Repishes became like my second family. I knew from a young age I wanted to be a doctor, but by meeting with Lily as a freshman, I also knew that one day I wanted to get involved with cancer research in addition to caring for patients. After college, I was grateful to begin medical training along with my new team of 47 other medical students at the UMD School of Medicine. Because our class was sm so small, it felt like one big family. And during this time, I grew even closer to Lily, who mentored and supported me through all of the rough spots that came with long hours of studying and medical board tests. In 1994, I went on to do my residency at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, which was a childhood dream of mine, and ended up joining the staff as a diagnostic and interventional radiologist in 2000. In training and now working at Mayo, where the motto is the needs of the patient come first, and where everyone on the patient care team works together to help diagnose and treat patients each and every day, has really taught me that as we keep moving forward in our lives, no matter what profession we choose, we need our team more than ever. In addition to clinical work, I am also involved in cancer research at Mayo, and working in research has taught me even more about how we need to keep growing our team. Early on in my career, I began working on pancreatic cancer research, which was and still is my passion. Being a radiologist, my goal is to find a better way to image and diagnose early pancreatic cancer before it is spread. I had an idea for a new molecular imaging technique to aid in early detection, but I needed additional expertise that I didn't have, and I also needed funding to do the work. So I was fortunate enough to be able to add other research collaborators as well as generous Mayo Clinic benefactors to the team to provide the expertise and funding that has been critical in moving our work forward. I also cannot express enough to you the importance of finding a mentor to help guide you on whatever path you choose. Every team needs a good coach, and Dr. Claire Bender, who is here with us tonight and who has also become like family to me, has been my clinical and research mentor since I was a resident at Mayo. And I can truly say that none of my research work would have been possible without her. And finally, every team needs inspiration and purpose. Pancreatic cancer is an ugly disease. And unfortunately, in 2011, I was devastated to find out that my dear friend, Lily Repish, was diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer. She passed away in 2012, only a year and a half after her diagnosis. In my heart, I know that Lily is still leading our team by giving us the reasons to keep fighting and working our hardest each and every day. And the last time I talked to Lily about research before she died, she also told me to never give up. Most importantly, you will always need the support of your family and friends, your strongest team of all. I have many of my team members here with me in the audience tonight, and I am so very grateful. Sports teach us well about how to deal with losing, but it is our family and friends that help us survive those losses and to grow from them. I'm a strong believer in giving back and believe that there are many different ways to do it, no matter how small they may seem or where you are on your journey. I believe that one of the best ways you can give back is through teaching or coaching. And my schedule doesn't allow me to coach my own team, but I was able to volunteer assist the coaches with the Rochester Century Boys Tennis Team that placed third in the state last spring. It was particularly fun for me because one of the other volunteer coaches was Tom Ainey, who played on the UMD men's team at the same time I was playing at UMD, and whose sister Val Ainey was actually my doubles partner. Another way to give back is through scholarship. 
It doesn't have to be a lot. Giving even the smallest amount adds up when it is done as a team. A good example of that is that Lilly's grateful medical students from over 30 plus years have already established and contributed to a scholarship in her name that has grown to a point where it is able to fund two UMD medical student scholarships each year. Her legacy will live on forever with this scholarship and it will continue to give back with the ability to help future medical students be successful. One of my favorite ways to give back is by introducing new people to tennis. <laughs> this was truly the happiest I have ever been giving a new racket to someone because this happens to be Lily Repish's granddaughter, baby Lily, getting her very first tennis racket. And I'm grateful to have her mama, Natalie, who trained as a nurse anesthetist at Mayo and is now working in Duluth, here with us tonight as well. Finally, you absolutely need to give back to yourself by finding ways to stay involved in sports and other things that you love for your own physical and mental health. As a very wise coach of mine has told me many times, you need to put your own oxygen mask on first. If you don't take care of yourself, you won't be here or able to help anyone else. So even though my second serve is as lousy as ever, I am still having fun playing competitively in tournaments and on several USTA tennis teams and as you can see, I still have a smiley face on my racket and on my face. To finish up, I would just like to share with you a picture of the Cambridge Varsity Girls tennis team today. A long ways from its start in 1981 as a one-girl team. I am also happy to report that Cambridge has a boys varsity team as well as a brand new tennis complex with eight beautiful new courts all of which started coming into being about five years after I graduated in 1985. An even better follow-up story is that I was able to return to Gustavus Tennis and Life Camp as an adult camper in the summer of 2014, just six months before Coach Wilkinson died after a long battle with kidney cancer. I was so grateful to be able to share with him my story about my one girl Cambridge tennis team and the smile on Coach Wilkinson's face was even bigger than the smiley face he had just painted on my racket. Finally, I would just like to say that I am very proud to be a former UMD student athlete. I am proud of all of the student athletes here tonight, and you should be very, very proud of yourselves. You are at an amazing school with an incredible athletic department and sports program. So seize the moment and the rest of the time you have here at Team UMD. And please always remember to never give up, keep building your team, find ways to give back, and most of all, keep smiling. It will serve you well. Thank you so much for having me.